curse? Yeah, no. we're, we're adults here, I think. Okay, he busted his ass, you know, like, trying to get me here, you know, because, you know, the great bureaucracy of money. But I really appreciate his hard work to get me here because I'm really happy to be here to share my story because it's what I would have wanted as a student, you know, sitting down in this chair. So, without further ado, um, my name's been said plenty of times, but I am going to tell a lot about this. Um, I'm an illustrator now, a graphic novel author, okay, and game designer. And I'm going to share my Latino journey, which includes how I became, how I went from nobody to somebody, my projects, and how I unlocked my drive and passion. Because I didn't have any of those things growing up. These are a little bit of the projects that I've done. So The Legend of Player Man, which we're going to get into, Borders, the video game I made about immigration and then my game studio that I started with a friend. So first and foremost, I am a first generation Mexican American. That means is my parents came over here and then they had me. So I was the first to be born here. I didn't learn English like first grade. Uh, and I, anyway, I ended up going to Lamar University to study drawing. I knew I liked drawing growing up, but I just drew in like my you know, college notebook paper. I didn't have fancy pencils or anything like that. Um, and I create video games and stories and graphic novels, books, pictures, etc. Uh, I was raised in a small town called Fort Arthur. Maybe the only way you've been able to hear about it was with the recent Harvey uh, hurricane that happened. We were flooded. On my thesis semester, which sucked, it was the last semester, and I had to rebuild my house and get my shit done. Um, I grew up discovering America alone. You know, like my parents, they didn't really know English. Uh, my parents hadn't gone through the American, you know, system. So I kind of had to learn things the hard way. Um, and then the town that you see before me, this is the beautiful refinery that we have. If you like to make money, that's a good place to go. If you like arts and culture, not really. This is what I thought it meant to be Mexican growing up. This is what I saw growing up. Uh, you know, cholos, you know, blue collar workers. Um, and that's what I thought it was supposed to be. And I was like, I don't want to be that. So I kind of didn't like being Mexican growing up. I was like, I don't want to be Mexican because I, my own Mexican community didn't like me. Because I was different, and then the American community didn't like me because I was different. So I was like, shit, who am I? Um, this is the type of stuff that I liked growing up. You know, I liked Pokemon. This was like my love and childhood. Um, I loved Curse, Cowboy Dog, Nightmare Before Christmas. This was the culture that I grew up on. And so being this Mexican kid in the small town, being like, I like this stuff. You know, and I want to do it one day. It just wasn't a possibility at the time. That was that was just not something I could do. I had to go, you know, be a carpenter or do hard work. I mean, look at me. All right, I'm not gonna go do that stuff. I'm so skinny. Um, but anyway, I I went to college, and I met two amazing people who changed my life. And that was Troutman, my drawing mentor, and Grace, my fiance, and. That's where I unlocked my need to succeed as an artist and uncover my Mexican roots. I didn't really care about education growing up. I was, I was the class clown. I, you know, I just got bad grades. I didn't care about anything. That was the only way people liked me, and so why not, right? Um, but it wasn't until college when I had someone believe in me that I realized I could do more. This is some of the work from my professor. He does these huge drawings. Um, and paintings, amazing guy. And then this is my fiance, Grace Chadwick, who does some really good work dealing with mental health and other subject matter. So this is the type of work that I did in high school, which is so much different from what I'm doing now. But this is all I had. I had no really good art education growing up. I didn't have these opportunities, so I just kind of made stuff. Uh, but then my first year or two in college, I was a printmaker. And I learned about printmaking, which is you cut into a piece of wood, and you put ink on it, and then you slap it on a piece of paper or something. And then you get an image. 
And that's kind of where I really started liking doing art with a lot of black, uh, the contrast. And it was during this time that I didn't really like doing Mexican artwork. I didn't really care about Mexican culture or my culture. I was more into monsters and creepy things uh, because I guess I felt like, you know, I like the bizarre stuff because I guess I was a weirdo growing up, so I like weird art maybe. <laughs> so I created these cards back in 15. And then I kept developing my style. Um, I got the opportunity to study abroad with my mentor in Japan. And I got to create some bigger artwork and kind of get better at my craft. And then in 2015, one of my professors decided to start a comic book class or a comic book group. I had never read a comic book growing up. I think the closest thing was like Captain Underpants <laughs> and maybe some manga. But I never you know, read a comic. I didn't have those things in my, you know, town. And I made this little comic about this guy in a chicken suit named Poyo Man beating up this guy for a churro. Um, it was my first comic, and, you know, it was just something funny, something funny to do, and I learned through him how to structure and make a comic. But that's kind of where Poyo Man was born. So Poyo Man, it was just a guy in a chicken suit. So, you know, what's what, what am I going to do with that? Well, the next theme for our comic was, all right, now you guys have to make a video game theme comic. And at the time, I was playing a game called Guacamelee. It's like Metroid, but Mexican, and it's awesome. Uh, and I was like, well, shit, we have like Lord of the Rings, we have Inuyasha, we have all these fantasy worlds about other cultures, like where the hell is Mexico? Like, why am I not seeing Mexican warriors? And so I was like, well, then I guess I'll make something about it. So I made this comic about this guy and his sidekick, La Cucaracha, um, <laughs> who had to go out and destroy this monster called El Cucuy, which is, <laughs> a lot of you may know who he is, but for you, you who do not, he is the Mexican boogeyman. He is the epitome of evil, okay? So don't be bad or he comes to you. Um, and I was inspired by this stuff. This is the type of stuff that I saw growing up. And this was kind of when I first started being like, hey, you know, we got some cool stuff in Mexico. Culture. Like, why don't we have more of it? You know, Day of the Dead, El Chavo del Ocho, El Chapulín Colorado, La Caracha. These were, these were things my dad would watch on TV and I would watch with them, but I didn't realize how much of an impact it made on me growing up. And so I continued that project up until 2016. So I am in like my sophomore year of college by this time. And so I created, no, not sophomore, junior. And so I created the teaser for Poyo Man. And I finally developed a story about it. It was gonna be about this boy, this, this boy who gets beat up all the time and no one likes him, uh, kind of like, I guess, me. <laughs> and El Raton de los Dientes, which is the Mexican tooth fairy who's a mouse, um, yeah, pretty creepy. Um, he comes and he steals his tooth and boom, he's in like this Aztec underworld where he has to defeat El Cucuy, La Llorona, and all these other monsters. And so at the time, I had this really cool idea, but I didn't really have the skill set. I hadn't really learned storytelling growing up, um, and I didn't really study it. And so I wanted it to be better, and so I put it away for a while, and I just practiced. And that's kind of when my next endeavor came in. And before we get into what it is, this is how I came up for the idea of orders. Um, I entered the McNair program. I don't know if you guys have one here. But McNair is uh, like an undergraduate research program. Basically, they pay you a big stipend to do a research project. If you have anything like that, go do it. Um, and I wanted to study how does pixel art affect the way we interact with a video game? Do we feel more or less empathetic towards a virtual character if it's pixelated? So I found this game called Papers, Please, because it was the first video game that I was like, man, I feel really bad for this person even though they're not real. It's a game where you play as a border agent and people come to you and tell you their story and you have to either accept or deny them into this country. So for example, this person's like, hey, if you don't let me in, I know I don't have my passport, but I'm gonna get killed if I go back. What do you do? So you make the decision and then there's consequences. And I was like, man, that really gets you thinking. And so I thought, what if there was a game where you're the immigrant? and you're trying to cross the border. So it was just this idea I had in my head, and I sketched it down, you know, my little sketch pad. 
And then at the time, 2016, Trump was running for president. And there was a lot of hate that started happening. There was a lot of, especially in my small town, there was a lot of hate towards immigrants. You know, the immigrants are, you know, still have jobs, they're rapists, they're this, they're that, right? But I'm like, no, dude, my parents crossed the border to have me here so I can get an education, so I can have better opportunities than they did. So I was pissed. I was mad. And I was like, I want to do something about this. And so before we get into the game Borders, I just want to quickly explain the video game medium. So, you know, when we think video game, we think Call of Duty, Minecraft, you know, stuff like that. But let's think about it differently for a second. The video game medium is just as any other art form. The only difference is there's an input device. You can interact with the artists. So just how you can interact with a painting by looking at it, well, now it's like you can play with a painting. And how does your input affect the results? And so I draw. I don't code. I don't know how to do that stuff. Um, so I was like, OK, I want to make this game, but how the hell am I going to do it? I, there was this festival called IndieCade that was about to happen called IndieCade East in 2016. And I was like, this sounds like somewhere I might figure it out. So I just flew on a limb. I used the little money I had to go fly out there. And I was like, I'm just going to go network and meet people. And I got there, and I met a lot of amazing people, but particularly these two guys, Enaro Vallejo Reyes and John Digiacomo. These guys would end up helping me make borders. Uh, nope. I guess it's not going to work. That's supposed to be a link here. But since it's not going to work, just pretend you can see the video. Um, I'll show pictures. Um, so he, I, I came back to Texas, and I was like, hey, guys, why don't we do a game jam? So a game jam is kind of like a, a hackathon. I don't know if you guys heard of those things. But basically, you give yourself a limited time to create something. And I was like, let's give ourselves a week. In one week, we need to finish a game. That's it. No more. No more than a week. And so I already had that idea of order sketched out. And I was like, look, it's simple. You just got to move from here to here. And then you got these characters trying to get you. So we made it in seven days. We sat down and we worked full time during the summer. This was a summer project. This wasn't a part of school. I just wanted to do this. And Borders was born. I wish I could show you a video. I can't get that one to work. Um, but here is the main poster for Borders. Um, the game, the mechanics of the game, here's some more images, was you're this character and you're trying to cross the border. You have to get from point A to point B, B being border. Along the way, you're trying to avoid the media or the border patrol agents. And you're also trying to stay hydrated. So there's this water canteen meter. And basically, as you're moving through the, through the land, it's going down. You have to find water jugs. That's what people actually have to do when crossing the border. There's water jugs that people leave behind so they can stay hydrated so they can make it. Um, and then the main feature of the game was the permanent skeletons. So basically, when you die in the game, you start over, you know, like Mario, you start back from the beginning. But every single time you die, those skeletons are going to stay there where you die. And so as you keep playing the game, those are going to build up. And the main reason for that was because my dad crossing the border illegally the third time around, he actually found a human skeleton. And that impacted me, you know? As a kid, I was like, oh, that's a scary story. But as an adult, you're like, shit, that was a person, you know? And so my intentions were to be like, look, imagine you're dying this many times in this small little video game. Imagine how many people are actually dying in real life. And so the game is beatable. Daniel can't beat it yet, but that's OK. I'll, I'll help him. Um, it is beatable, but when you do beat it, you do get to see this dreamscape, this, this American dream. This is what, what my parents envisioned, essentially. The, the American dream, the big city, the place where I can change my life and actually have a foundation. Uh, that's actually Port Walker, the refineries that you saw. Uh, that's what I saw growing up all the time. Um, now, the game was released in July 4th of 2016. Terrible day to release anything because everyone's out partying or, you know, popping stuff. 
Um, and so, popping fireworks. <laughs> and so, um, and so anyway, the game just kind of stayed on itch.io where I uploaded it for you know who knows how long. And I was like, man, you know, no one's really getting to interact with it as much as I wanted to. And so I thought, what if I put it in a public place? And I was like, how am I going to do that? You know, no one's going to want to come up to a computer. And while I was at IndieCade, I saw these amazing art cabinets. These people made a video game, and they had created an arcade cabinet that was based off the video game. This was like cut into and stuff. And I was like, man, that is so cool. That's like, that's like a frame to a painting, right? Like the frame to a video game is the arcade cabinet. And so I went up to my chair uh, of my art department, and I was like, hey, I have this idea, but I'm very poor. Can you help me? Uh, and, and just to mention something, my school, my Lamar school, uh, Lamar University, they don't teach arts in the comics. They don't teach animation. They don't teach um, video games. They teach fine art. You know, they teach painting, sculpture, drawing, etc. All the fundamentals. All this stuff I was doing because I wanted to. And so my other goal was to show my school that video games can be art. And to show the world that video games can be art. And so she helped me get a little scholarship. I ordered the pieces. I put it together. I painted it. Bought you know, put in my old laptop inside, got all my stuff off of it, uh, and I created this cabinet for it. And I created an art installation. I created 42 drawings, uh, pixelated, that went all around the room. And so these drawings were supposed to be like a fence. Uh, uh, was supposed to be like a fence. So basically, as you're playing the game, it's like you're trying to cross the border in a sense. Like, the border's right there. And these are some of my friends who basically, you know, were art students as well. They would go up and play it. And the whole thing was, as people were going up to play this, they would see skeletons of other people and they wouldn't know that was someone else. They just thought I, you know, put the, the sprite in there. But then when they would die and be like, wait, is that my skeleton? They would be like, whoa, you know, they'd have that revelation. All these other skeletons are other players who died playing the game. There was over a thousand skeletons by the end of the art installation. Everyone told me it was addicting, it was fun. We had this guy who was like a super speedrunner game guy. He like, you know, destroyed my game basically. He found glitches and stuff. Uh, but then the craziest thing happened. I posted this on Instagram, just how I was always posting my art, you know, being like, hey, I exist, I'm making stuff. And then I got an email from Huffington Post, and I was like, you know, I was in Austin on a graphic design trip, and we were supposed to be visiting A&M, and I stayed in the bus instead of going to what we were going to do, and I pulled out my mobile hotspot because I had to, like, quickly write it by, like, 3 p.m., and it was, like, 2. Um, but anyway, I ended up doing that. And then the next day when it went live, I got an email from Huffington Post, I mean, Washington Post, Fox News, Univision, Telemundo, Despert America, and I was like, oh, my God, what's going on? And there was just like every single news channel that I heard about growing up was contacting me for my project. And so that entire week, I literally had to skip school because I had so many back-to-back -back interviews. It was, it was insane. I didn't know how to handle it. I was like, you know, they were like, can you wake up for this at 5 a.m.? And I was like, I guess. <laughs> but, um, and so, you know, oh, cool. I, a video's going to work. So here's one of them, Now This. You may have heard of Now This. They pop on Facebook and stuff. I don't know how loud it's going to be or it has sound at all. Uh, oh, look, sound.
So, yeah, there was many, many um, videos like that that were just popping up everywhere and I was sharing them and stuff. And so not only did I get, you know, international news coverage on my name, but I was invited to a documentary film festival, Sheffield Doc Fest in the UK. And I was like, oh my God, let's go to England. Uh, and then right before I confirmed I also got accepted to go show it at Indicate at E3, which is like, for those who don't know about video games, E3 is like the trade show of the world. It's like, I don't know, like the Oscars of video games or something, right? It's, it's a big deal. And so I kind of had to choose E3. <laughs> um, and so I got to fly out to Los Angeles for the first time in my life. Uh, I love California weather. Um, and I got to show my game to thousands of people. I got to see creators of all sorts of uh, levels. You know, I got to see all the big game developers that I grew up watching on TV, because I was that nerd who would sit during the E3 previews and be like, oh my god, what's the next game, you know? And now I was there. And not only that, I was at the festival that I went to the previous year where I met the two guys that helped me make this. And it was just all a surreal moment uh, I still think back, like, man, I did that? That's so weird. Uh, my friend instead, Hanaro, the co-creator, went to the UK to show it. On top of that, the game got accepted into their Latin American tour, so it went on to go to Argentina, Portugal, and Brazil. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, and Uruguay. And so this is a picture they took in one of those places. Uh, really good picture they took. Um, now, it all sounds like it was amazing, right? Like. It was an amazing experience. I got to meet a lot of people. I got famous or whatever. And I got the opportunities to come speak to people like you. But there was a lot of shit happening too, you know? I had to deal with people calling my parents, you know, roaches. Um, I had to deal with people saying, you know, they want to find my parents so they can deport them, but they're citizens and you can't really do that. Um, and then people tell me, like, you have to go back. And I'm like, back where? I was born here, you know? So. It was a lot of, um, it took a lot for me to not respond to these type of negative comments, you know, because you, there's some people you can't change their minds. But that's why I created the game. Was, so hopefully I can get those type of people to come to this game not knowing what it's about. Or if they do, it's, it's in a way that's not shoving anything down your throat. You know, I wasn't like, Look at this game, and it's just like being on immigration, and, and you know you were bad or whatever. But it's like you play a game. That's what you're doing. You're playing a game, but it has a meaning behind it. I'm using the power of the gameplay to tell the story rather than just telling you with words or pictures. Because I could have made a drawing about it, right? I could have made, I don't know, a comic about it. But I felt like the video game medium 
allowed me to get people to experience it. Because that's what video games do, right? We have a virtual experience. Then, during that year, I also discovered something amazing. And it was the Codex Borgia and Fejervari Maya. So what are these? These were the books the people you would consider Aztecs made. I mean, look at this stuff. This stuff looks like video game art. This stuff looks like art that would be created now. It's so bold, it's beautiful. It's so, it, it was essentially the first comic. They didn't have a written language. They used glyphs. So for example, that monkey down there, that's also Makui, that means monkey. That house, that's Kali. So they used pictures to say what they had to say. And that's what comics do, right? We use pictures and words now. And so I began studying you know, this culture, the, the Mesoamerican roots that we don't know about, you know? Um, the Mexica, that's where Mexicans come from. We have the indigenous people from Tenochtitlan, which is, you know, where Mexico City is now. There was an entire city there, and then there was a Spanish conquest that came and destroyed everything. So what I decided was, I wanted to learn more about myself as a Mexican-American. I wanted to know more about my indigenous roots because I didn't get those taught to me growing up. You know, my parents did their best to teach me about Mexican culture, but my indigenous culture, the Nahuatl culture, wasn't something in my life. And I was like, it's so cool, why the hell is it in my life? So I went up to my uh, chair and I was like, hey, remember you gave me money and I made something and it actually did really well? Could I get some more? <laughs> Uh, and so my mentor and, and the chair and all, everyone really helped me find scholarships, helped me find, I had to write a bunch of proposals, and I finally got one that allowed me to fund a trip to go to Mexico City to go draw in person the pyramids. This is me at Teotihuacan, the Sun Pyramid. This is Xochimilco, the, what's left of the floating Aztec gardens. They had to create floating gardens because the mainland couldn't, uh, you know, grow the type of plants they needed. The sompanculis, the racks of heads, the skeleton heads. This is Huehueteo, you know, this is a grandpa, grand, fire grandpa, uh, this is the god of fire. And then all these images, I was just like, this is such a beautiful culture, why isn't it, you know, in pop culture? Why haven't I seen a movie about this? Why haven't I seen a cartoon about this? Why haven't I seen a video game about this? Like, what's going on? And so I went, I researched, I drew, I learned a lot, and I came back, and then that's when the hurricane happened, and I had to spend like two weeks building my freaking room, uh, you know, sheep rock and all. But as you can see, going there and looking at all that imagery, it influenced, right? It influenced what I would then create with my final thesis project, which would be the prologue to The Legend of Hoya Man. And so that's, for example, one of the codex images I did of La Llorona, which is the weeping ghost woman. Basically, she's this weeping ghost woman who killed her kids, drowned them, uh, different, you know, different versions, but essentially she also ends up dying. And she is now a ghost haunting at night near rivers, crying, you know, oh, let me see you close, which is like, oh, my children. And she's still little kids. So if you go out at night, she's going to come out. And that was a cool. So, here, I learned all those images, stuff, the, the glyphs. I learned how to read and draw them. That glyph right there with the flowers, those are Sochi. And then the bottom part is Mil, so Sochi, Milko, the place of the flowers. Uh, I don't know how to, I forgot how to say tree, but that's a tree. Uh, they did not have teeth. Teeth is just an image you put on something to say that there's many of them. So anytime they have teeth, it means there's a lot of them. Um, but anyway. I had to learn all this, and it was fun. It was fun, because this is real stuff. And so these are some of the images I had from the prologue. And I actually created my own codex. I made a codex version of the first issue, and I presented it as my thesis work. This was like a picture I took after the event, because I always forget to take pictures. Um, but anyway, this was like my thesis show. And so that was the end of my career at Lamar University. That was the end of my bachelor's degree. I graduated with you know, pretty good grades. I was the first to graduate college. I was the first in my entire family. 
have a very big family, and I'm sure most of you do. But I was the first to, to, to go through the entire system by myself. You know, I didn't have mom or dad when we went through college. I didn't have all that, you know, I didn't have the new car. I had hand me down cars that broke down every second. It was tough, but it was worth it. You know, it was all the work that I put into it that helped me get to where I'm at today. I was able to travel to Mexico. I was able to travel to Japan. I was able to travel to E3 all during my college career, my bachelor's degree. And so I graduate. Now what, right? It's like, okay, you have a degree, you go get a job, right? Well, I wanted to continue making Poyo Man. Like, I thought I did a good job. I was very much in love with the idea, and I just continued to expand it. And so in 2018, because uh, I graduated fall 2017, my fiance also graduated, and she got an internship at an art museum, and I was like, look, I want to work on this, and she believed in me. She's like, and I'm going to let you work on this. She became the breadwinner for the year. I got to work full-time on Poyo Man, and it wasn't easy. I spent, I recorded all my time. This isn't even all of it. I forgot to punch in sometimes. I'm very methodical, but I spent over 300 hours creating that first chapter of chapter one. This one right here is the new one that I created. Uh, I worked day in, day out, wake up you know, at six, go to sleep at 10, draw all day. Um, it was hardcore because I had to get it finished by uh, July, the end of July, because I was going to go to Texas Latino Comic Con to present it. And so anyway, this is a preview of what chapter one has inside. You can already see the artwork compared to what I had in the prologue is already much better. I spent a lot more time learning the tool that I was using. I used a digital device. I bought me those big uh, like Wacom tablet things because you know if I'm gonna do this by hand, I mean, if I wanna take five years maybe, <laughs> but I did it digitally. And so this is like one of the pages, uh, you know, Michoacan, Mexico. Uh, it's where I based, uh, actually called Tija Michoacan, if some people know or not. That's where my family's from. And so those temple or the, the uh, church and all the houses, those are reference pictures I took while I was in Cotima. Because I really wanted this to be the first time <coughs> that a Mexican or Latino can look at a book and be like, I can relate to this, right? It's like, it's not castles, it's not medieval castles, it's not all this, it's a Mexican pueblo. I've been in one of those, right? And so here's like the final image where Emmanuel our, uh, my main character ends up in the Aztec underworld and in the catacomb of the ratones, the mice. And so I just, I continue making the artwork for it. I continue playing around with the characters, the designs. I went to Texas Latino Com Comic Con, Mex Americon, so many different cons showing my work, a lot of amazing things. But then one amazing thing happened. John Picasso, he's the guy who does the cover art for George R. R. Martin's Song of Song and Fire series, the uh, Game of Thrones. He makes the cover art for Game of Thrones, and he was like, "Dude, I like your stuff. I'm inviting 50 Mexicans to go to the Hugo Awards, and I want you to be a part of those." And I was like, "You know, like, what? People like my work." And so I was able to be in San Jose, California, last year, beautiful town or city, big city, um, with my fiance, and you know, creative. Assistant. She has been helping since the very beginning. She does the flats. She does editing. She does critiquing. She makes sure I feed myself so I don't die. Um, she's she's an amazing human being. And so while I was there, I got to meet some amazing people, including George R. R. Martin himself, amazing guy. But most importantly, I got to meet uh, Desh. I think her name is Deshing, and I'm so sorry I wrote her name. Um, but she is a creator, and she gave me a list of agents. And I was like, agents? You know, what's an agent? And she proposed that I should maybe look at agents to try to get a publisher. At first, my idea was I wanted to self-publish, right? I wanted to make this thing myself, sell it myself, do things myself. And I had been doing that while I was selling Chapter 1, but it wasn't, you know, making enough for me to eat off of. It wasn't, and it was not that that worried me, but... It just wasn't going to be able to sustain me, sadly. And so I was like, you know what? Maybe an agent might like my work. Maybe they will. And so I spent five hours one day looking through the list of agents she gave me. And I only found two that were Latino. 
And I was like, man, there's like a hundred Asians and there's like only two Latinos. So I found one named Marietta and she worked for the Galaxy Zachary Agency. And I finally found her and I followed her on Twitter. Because you know, I was following other people, I was, you know, thinking about, you know, trying to be my agent. And I went to go grab a sandwich and I was like, man, I'm so tired from looking at agents. And I come back and there's a DM, you know, she like dropped into my inbox. And I was like, why do I have a DM from Marietta? What's going on? So I look at it, and she's like, you sold me at Boyle Man. And I'm like, I didn't even say anything yet. And she was like, you know, you just followed me. That's your fault. I saw Boyle Man. I don't know what it is, but I want to know now. And so anyway, we hopped on a call the next day, and boom, she was like, I'm going to represent Boyle Man. So I am now signed with the Galaxy Zachary Agency, a literary agency. Um, same agency that also has Percy Jackson's uh, Rick Riordan's work. And I am so humbled that I have had this opportunity to have found someone who would, you know, want to be my agent. And so I continued creating work. And I decided to, you know, work a little bit more on the story before I would send it off to publishers. And so we spent about three months looking at publishers and we sent it off to three different publishers. There was an auction finally from, I can't say who the publisher is yet, but you'll find out soon on Twitter and Instagram and all that. But after that auction, I finally got a book deal. Poyo Man has a two book deal with one of the top five publishers and it will be releasing in 2021 and 2022, book one and two. Uh, book one is gonna be about El Rafa de los Yentes. Uh, book two is going to be La Llorona, and then I have six other plans. Um, these are graphic novels, so I'm going to be drawing a lot. Uh, I still got to finish drawing it. But these are posters I made of El Diablo, El Ratón, El Chupacabras, El Cucuy. Actually, that's my dog. Um, but his name is El Cucuy uh, because he is black as night. And when he's when it's nighttime, his eyes are like yellow to me and scary. Um, but here is the official poster for The Legend of Poirot. These are the main characters, and I'm going to talk a little bit about them because I love these people. Um, it's, I spent so long, I don't know if you can remember the images from the older artwork, but it's definitely changed a lot. Um, this is Poyo Man, and my Noel becomes Poyo Man. And the story is about this young, timid kid who ends up in the Aztec underworld and finds out that because he's human, he's the only one who can overcome and defeat these creatures, eating the people of Mitlán. Mitlán is the underworld of the Mexica, or the Aztecs, as you would know them. And so he has to develop the courage to call on the sun god, Donatil, the god of the sun, to defeat these monsters. He's the only one who can do it, but he's got to overcome those fears, those challenges. With his friend, Sochi, she is a girl from Xochimilco, but she's not allowed to be a warrior, but she doesn't care, because she's going to do it anyway. And she uses the Atla. The Atla is a spear throwing device that the Mexica used. It was more powerful than a bow because that extension allowed it to be a lot harder hitting. And then her sidekick, or her little best friend, is an Ashola. His name is Chiki. Uh, an Ashola, if you guys don't know, is a indigenous creature just to those gardens I showed you earlier. So Chimilco is the only place in the world, as, at least at the time, where you could find the Ashola. And it is the only creature also in the world that can regenerate its limbs and even parts of its brain. Uh, that's why it was seen as Ashola means water monster. Uh, and that's why, because it could trend, you know, it could grow its limbs back like Piccolo or something. Um, and then finally, we got Kuka. Kuka is La Cucaracha. He's this young boy who's you know, been brought up by the Sun Temple from the age of 12. And he is basically Koya uh, Man's mentor. And so he has a staff model that's the Vero Mango Lollipop. I don't know if you guys know the spicy mango. Uh, yeah. uh, he found one from the human world and he's like, oh, this is cool and it's, it's spicy. Uh, you know? uh, and then finally, Koya Man, he has the very specific gear to the Mexica. He wears a, uh, crap, I'm gonna maybe mess it up, but I think it's called a Blauitsu which is their uniform. They would wear these almost pajama-looking things. It was like a like a, a onesie. It was the first onesies, but they were for battle. And you, you, could, you could upgrade your onesies every time you got a capture in the Flower Wars. 
The Bible words were these ritualistic wars that the different nations or states fought each other to get sacrifices for the gods. Now, when we think about the Aztecs, that's probably the first thing you think, right? Sacrifice, right? But they had a political, social, and economical system that was very developed for their time. They view death in a different way than we do today. Death isn't the end, but the beginning. Death was a cycle, and it was not you know, the end of life, but it was the beginning of your next life. So they were honored to give their heart up for their gods who were providing the earth, the crops, the water that they were given. The sacrifices, or prisoners of sacrifice, they were willing to be sacrificed. They were, it was an honor to be giving your life to continue your culture. Now, there's a bag of worms to open there, right? But essentially, Catholic, you know, Spanish comes over, they didn't really care for that, and they changed a lot of things. But my goal with Hoyerman is to bring back everything they, they had. They had their own system, they had their own flowers that they used for different things, they had their own potions, essentially. They had magic. They literally had wizards, people who would heal you, you know, like shamans, essentially. They had this beautiful, rich culture. So why is it that we see feudal era Japan? Why is it that Inuyasha, Naruto, uh, Bleach, all these um, Japanese-centric cultures, we have thousands and thousands of versions of them, right? And then medieval, don't even get me started on that. How many medieval games have you played or watched or seen? Like It's like, okay, we got another knight with a dragon. Oh, he's not saving a princess this time. He's killing her, same thing. Um, <laughs> So why isn't there the Mexica culture, the Nahuatl culture, our culture? And so that's what I'm setting out to do, is create the first Mexican fantasy universe in the form of a graphic novel series, and hopefully soon, a video game, and animation, and socks, and toys, and everything. You know? <laughs> so what I want to leave you guys with is, you know, and I said this a year ago, so now it'd be two years ago, but be once I was finished with my bachelor's degree, you know, a year ago at the time, I didn't know how to make games. A year ago at the time, I didn't know how to write stories. But now, today, I can do all of that. I wasn't constricted to my degree to decide what I could do, right? Like, if you go for psychology, great, that's awesome. Psychology is a wonderful thing. I've had to learn a lot of psychology to be able to develop personalities and characteristics, how people react from a story. But why is it that you can't make something with your knowledge of psychology? Why is it you can't make something with your knowledge of engineering? Why is it you can't make something with your knowledge of mathematics? Like, you don't have to be confined to a job that is just specifically to do one thing. You can create things with your skill sets, because that's what you're doing. You're paying people to give you skill sets faster than you would learn them yourselves. You know, my bachelor's degree, everyone was telling me, you know, what are you going to do with an arts degree? It's like, eh, nothing. It's a piece of paper. But all the knowledge and skill that I was passed down by my mentors, that's what it was worth for. And now, I'm making this stuff. So, the reason I do and create is because I want to tell our stories, the, Mex the Mexica stories, the Mexican stories. I want to give kids role models. I want to be a role model for kids. The one I wish I had growing up. I wish I had you know, a Mexican in power, especially in the creative field, to say, you can become an artist. You're not gonna live under a bridge. You know, you can become a cartoonist, an animator, uh, you know, I don't know, whatever. You can become whatever you wanna be. I didn't have that, but thankfully I met a lot of people who believed in me. And then finally, I wanna bring something new. Like I said, I'm tired of seeing the same thing over and over. And I see things all the time and I'm like, well, why can't this other thing exist? So, hard work pays off, as you can see, you know? Make stuff, put it on Instagram, and maybe Huffington Post may contact you as well, you know? Like, just, just work hard for what you want to do, and don't be confined to what you think you have to do. So, there's not much more to say, but I want to say a special thanks to my mentors, Daniela Delarue and Christopher Troutman, who are essentially like my second parents. Um, the Department of Art and Undergraduate Research Office who helped fund all these 
research trips, my, my parents for giving me, you know, a loving home and feeding me some great food. Um, and all of like Echo Reyes and John and Giacomo, because without them, the game wouldn't have existed. And then finally, my fiance and muse and my everything, Grace Chadwick, she has been the pivotal moment of my life because she was the first human being to believe in me. And so we all should believe in each other and support each other because it can make a big difference, you know? So thank you everyone for being here today. It was a pleasure to be able to talk to you. If you want to support Player Man, it won't be out till 2021, but I do have art, posters, available stickers, and you can find them all at legendofplayerman.com. And then I also have a Patreon if you wanted to support it. Right now, for the month of March, I am giving away this art, and I'm going to mail it to your house, and I'm going to draw doodles and stuff. Um, so, and then finally, if you want to contact me on Twitter, social media, Instagram, at John Zane, hit me up, you know, pop up in my DMs, just like my Maria did. Uh, but, and then finally, if you have any questions, gonzaloavarez.artist at gmail.com. Email me, ask me whatever you want. But uh, thank you, everyone, and I really appreciate you being here. Two things. Number one, before you leave, please hand that little paper that you received at the entry. And number two, we're going to have a little Q&A session uh, with Gonzalo. So if you guys have any questions, comments, complaints, now will be the time. Yes. Yes, sir. So there's a uh, one point in your PowerPoint where you were showing like a picture of like the photos and then yeah. Uh, I think going to Mexico, um, specifically going to Mexico City, and meeting non, um, getting to meet a whole other side of the Mexican culture that wasn't brought over, at least where I'm from in my little town. Getting to see the, you know, the beautiful, you know, hand carved alebrijes. You know, getting to eat the food, getting to, getting to see the musicians in the streets, getting to have a more, I guess, real experience. Because a lot of the the stereotypes that I grew up with, uh, they were kind of, you know, a lot of people believed in that themselves that they were supposed to be those stereotypes. And so I think that shift really was like when I set foot on Mexico City, I just saw that there was so much more. There was so much more to what we are. And now I don't look back at those things and think those are beneath or bad or evil. I look back and I see, you know, those are just another part of our culture. And just because I wasn't a part of it growing up doesn't mean there isn't another part I can be a part of. Any other questions? Anything at all? Yeah. Um, so, also being a Pokemon fan, uh, I'm, I'm yeah. curious, uh, what's your favorite Pokemon? My favorite Pokemon, man. There's so many now. There's like 800 or 900. But, uh, man, you can't go wrong with Typhlosion. He's, he's, he's a cool one. That version is the coolest. Um, all right. Any other questions? Yeah. Do you want to ask questions about my dog? That's fine too. What's up? So I know that growing up in a Latino or Mexican household, it's sometimes your parents use like video games or you know drawing as cheese bits or you know See, like, like a waste of time. How was it that? How was the support from your parents? Uh. Well. They were like, oh, hijo, you draw so bonito and stuff, but, you know, why don't you become a lawyer or a doctor or a professor or something? You know, go, go do something that makes money and you can do this on the side, right? Um, I think part of the reason I have such drive and passion is because I, I saw it as a challenge. I was like, you know what? I'm going to go to college for art because at first they weren't happy about it. And I'm going to show you. I was like, by the time I graduate, I don't know how long I'm going to do it or what I'm going to be doing, but by the time I graduate, I'm going to prove it to you. And so that was, they, at first it was hard, but whenever reporters came around, whenever I got to study in Japan and they got to see how much it changed me as a person, you know, um, I think they started coming around. 
So yeah, it's just uh, sadly sometimes we just gotta prove it, you know. Yeah. Any other questions? What's up? Yes. Um, were there times where you felt like you wanted to give up? Yes. Oh my God, I should have talked about that. God, I cried so many times during college. Uh,